Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you for listening today. Go check out reallifepharmacology.com. We've got that free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, great no-brainer to have simply for uh, an email there. So absolutely free, no cost to you. Uh, just an email is all it's going to cost you. Uh, with that said, we get you out new updates when we've got new podcasts and other content available as well if you're on our email list. So uh, definitely go and uh, get that done at reallifepharmacology.com. The drug of the day today is naltrexone. A brand name of this medication is uh, Revia, uh, otherwise known as uh, Vivitrol as well, which is uh, an injectable formulation of this medication. So naltrexone is an opioid antagonist. Uh, if you've listened to the podcast for some time, uh, I have covered an opioid antagonist already, and that would be naloxone, uh, brand name of Narcan there. Uh, naltrexone is used in a, kind of a significantly different way uh, than naloxone. Uh, so just kind of summing it up here uh, briefly here, uh, naltrexone blocks uh, opioids effects basically um, by binding to those um, mu receptors uh, at a fairly high affinity. They do uh, bind them pretty significantly so other opioids uh, can't bind there. With that said, I will say patients... Um, there is reports of this as well. Uh, when you start blocking a receptor, um, what can happen is the body basically responds to that and it's not feeling enough endogenous opioid activity potentially or it feels like it may need to feel more. And so the body, because those receptors are blocked, starts upregulating receptors. So basically, you know, producing, creating more um, and having them more readily available to receive um, kind of that binding and the stimulation. So anyway, patients, uh, because of this potential upregulation over time, uh, they may be at more risk for opioid overdose, particularly in the setting if the patient you know, abrupt, abruptly stops taking um, and then they initiate opioids and things. So um, patients may be at more risk for opioid overdose, and that's uh, thought to be due to that upregulation of opioid receptors uh, because naloxone being used on a chronic basis for uh, opioid use disorder or alcohol use disorder uh, is going to uh, block those receptors and, and cause that uh, potential uh, upregulation. So uh, definitely a, a challenging um, aspect uh, to using this medication um, in these these settings. So those are the two primary uses um, for uh, naltrexone by itself. Uh, it's important for alcohol use disorder treatment um, to recognize that if patients are taking opioids, we probably want to avoid naltrexone because that's going to directly block the effects of the opioids. Um, same thing with like, you know, acute pain management and, you know, scheduled um, surgeries, for example, where we may use opioids um, in the event that, you know, we don't have other options that are good for the patient for, for pain management and we still have to use opioids. Uh, we've got to recognize that this patient's on naltrexone and develop a plan uh, to basically address that. So, uh, in alcohol use disorder, avoid of taking opioids. Another situation to avoid uh, is hepatic impairment. Um, naltrexone um, is associated with causing some uh, hepatic issues, and I'll, I'll touch on that in the adverse effects. Uh, in alcohol use disorder, it may uh, be started even if drinking. So some of the original agents we had for alcohol use disorder, uh, like disulfiram, for example, um, basically causes nasty um, adverse effects if uh, you take or use alcohol with that medication. Uh, now, Trexone actually can be initiated or started even while the patient is still drinking. So that's kind of an, an interesting uh, one there. Uh, in opioid use disorder, uh, if we're using naltrexone, um, pay attention. It's not recommended to start naltrexone uh, until the patient is opioid-free for 
seven to 14 days. And this can kind of depend upon, you know, the half-life of the opioid that the patient's using, for example. So say they were taking methadone, which has a really long half-life. Well, anyway, if we give that naltrexone too soon, uh, the situation we end up in is we're going to basically precipitate opioid withdrawal. Um, and so that can, can be a challenge with the initiation of naltrexone in opioid use disorder. So again, do not start uh, typically until that patient is opioid free for you know 7 to 14 days in that range. Uh, dosing, uh, oral dosage form, we've got 25 to 100 milligrams is kind of the usual dosing range. Um, 50 is probably the dose I've seen u- utilized most often. Uh, the IM formulation is is every four weeks. So 380 milligrams. Obviously that can be advantageous um, potentially in a patient population uh, that may not be very good at medication adherence, for example. Um, I have seen that uh, injection interval maybe once or twice, uh, less than four weeks, but that's probably more of an off-label thing. Um, done by by a specialist in patients that you know aren't quite responding uh, the way that that we'd like to and things, um, but there isn't a ton of data to really support that. Um, but that is something that I, I have seen a, a couple of times. All right, let's chat about adverse drug reactions. So, um, in general, some of the maybe more common things are stomach upset nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that that can happen. I wouldn't call it crazy high percentage, but uh, just be aware it's out there, it can happen. Uh, Syncope has been reported as well. Um, Hepatotoxicity, this is definitely um, something that could come up uh, on a board exam for sure. You've got to recognize that naltrexone is associated uh, with hepatotoxicity. Uh, In our patients with alcohol use disorder, you really better recognize, you especially better recognize this because patients typically who have had alcohol problems or somewhat commonly uh, may have liver issues as well. And so uh, that's one where you really got to pay attention uh, to if we can use naltrexone or not. If they do have pre-existing uh, liver issues or active liver dysfunction um, in alcohol use disorder, then we might be looking at something uh, like a camprosate, for example, there. Uh Opioid overdose risk, I kind of alluded to that already, um, recognizing uh, that we could have that upregulation for opioid receptors. Uh, With the injectable formulation of naltrexone, the IM injection, um, we could certainly have some injection site reactions, pain, bruising, um, even severe things have been reported such as infection, hematoma, and things of that nature too, so pay attention to that. Uh, Of course, it may precipitate withdrawal. Um, so keep in mind uh, some of those opioid withdrawal symptoms, you know, sweating and GI upset and things of that nature. Uh, depression, uh, increase in suicidal thoughts, these have been reported as well. I wouldn't call it crazy common in my experience, but um, uh, definitely I, I think it's important to uh, be aware there anyway of that. Okay, pharmacokinetics. Uh, Duration of action for uh, the oral formulation uh, is in the neighborhood of of 24 to 48 hours. So that's typically going to cover us uh, for the once once daily dosing for the oral formulation. Uh, And then monitoring, uh, of course, depending upon what we're treating, um, our monitoring parameters may vary a little bit. Um, From a lab standpoint, uh, LFTs are going to be the most important thing. Um, with regards to lab monitoring and adverse effects associated with naltrexone. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for any pharmacist board certification study material, we've got a bunch of resources on BCM TMS, BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, NAPLEX exam, um, all at meded101.com slash store. Fed thousands of customers at this point and uh, definitely have helped uh, a lot of them prepare and pass their exam. So um, simply by supporting meded101.com slash store, you can help support this podcast. If you're another healthcare professional, we've got growing resources there as well. We've got stuff for uh, nursing students, pharmacy technicians, med students, 
PAs, nurse practitioners, books on case studies, drug interactions, primary care, uh, all sorts of different stuff. Um, that entire list of, of books on, on Amazon, Audible books, uh, you can find all those links. Uh, go check it out. Uh, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. Uh, not a ton of drug interactions with naltrexone, so that is definitely a nice thing. Um, the things that I look out for the most, uh, opioid use. So reminder that if a patient is on opioids and you start naltrexone, uh, it's likely going to induce opioid withdrawal. So we've, we've definitely got uh, to remember that because the drug uh, is going to prevent opioid agonists such as you know morphine, oxycodone, and so on and so forth. Um, naltrexone is going to block those opioids from binding to their appropriate sites and uh, having the, the analgesic action. So definitely recognize that, um, that opioid effects are, are likely going to be blunted uh, with this medication. And really the only other major thing that I think of with drug interactions and naltrexone is the hepatotoxicity risk. So recognizing um, if you've got patient on amiodarone, uh, methotrexate, isoniazid, uh, maybe higher doses of acetaminophen, valproic acid, these are all examples of medications uh, that can cause some hepatic impairment uh, and that may have kind of some additive effects on top of uh, the hepatotoxic nature of naltrexone. So definitely something to, to pay attention to um, if a patient's at a little bit higher risk there. And then I did want to also reemphasize uh, if we're using it in patients with alcohol use disorder, they may be more prone uh, to having some of those pre-existing liver uh, issues already. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, do me a huge favor. Leave a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, and of course, go get your free PDF at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, continue to share us with friends, colleagues, healthcare professionals, students that you work with. Help us grow the podcast. Uh, help us educate as many healthcare professionals and future healthcare professionals uh, as we can. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. If you have comments, uh, suggestions, didn't like the way I presented something, thought I made an error on something, um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, Mededucation101 at gmail.com. Uh, or you can track me down, uh, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP on LinkedIn. I am certainly not immune uh, to making mistakes. Hopefully I don't make many, um, but of course I'm definitely uh, uh, human in that capacity for sure. So uh, with that said, uh, thank you so much for listening. Greatly appreciate it and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.